We are going to see today two projects that were born during the first year of the terraforming. Uh, the terraforming is this design research program hosted at the Strelka Institute for Media, Architecture and Design, located in Moscow. Um, the projects we are going to see today are Cassandra and Cosmos Law. Both projects, I could say, rely on modeling and sensing as tools to address the transformations required to face climate crisis. Cosmos Law proposes a governance articulated but an independent their dependency between different layers of the celestial bodies that on chain of feedback between sensing ecosystems and resource extraction. Cassandra, however, speculates around a possible recursivity between sensing and sovereignty, for example, to define the control of our territory in the case it is identified as a carrier of um, resources or viable resources. The program, directed by Benjamin Bratton, comes with the participation of an amazing faculty that gathers um, thinkers as Josip Arika, Helen Hester, Nandita Sharma, or Reza Negaristani, to speculate about the transformations that have to be planned on the Earth to enable it to remain a viable host for life forms. We will see the video um, that they developed that uh, was presented at the end of the program in a way, yeah, in a way that that end of the program, I would say that uh, we like to understand the, the program or the end of the program as the beginning, actually, um, because it's when those researches start to overcome the, the framework or the proposal that Benjamin um, kind of uh, present in this book. No? So after the videos, they will share how the researches are evolving and where are they now. The term terraforming usually refers to the transformation that ecosystems of other planets or moons to make them capable of supporting Earth-like life. But the ecological consequences that we start to experience nowadays due to the human action on the planet suggest that in the decades to come, we will need to transform Earth as well. If it is to remain a viable host for Earth-like life. Terraforming then, terraforming then refers both to the terraforming that has taken place on Earth in the past over the course of urbanization, and also to the terraforming that must now be planned and conducted as a planetary design initiative to prevent future catastrophes. Some months ago, Caja Negra translated the text written by Benjamin Bratton that works as the basis for the design research program. This text constitutes the agenda of the issues that were to be addressed during the three editions of this six months uh, think tank. However, it also sets a specific understanding of how this process of transformation of the air have to be addressed, from the assumptions from where to start to the selection of a certain set of concepts or techniques to build the schema to the main language used, the book constitutes a political statement. The framework that Benjamin Bratton proposes has to be understood as a starting point to be questioned and problematized. It was absolutely necessary and radically important that he started this conversation as much as it is necessary now to evolve and uh, complete and shape um, the set of concepts. I would say this is the reason why we are here today, to discuss different ideas of how to terraforming can be, to share, speculate, complexify, open, think, deconstruct, construct, reframe, expand, and generate together alternative, alternate, yeah, alternative the series of all trans terraformings to come. Bratton's idea of terraforming is one, and we can say is his idea built up of around, like, uh, surrounded by a lot of people, but it is a specific one that, as he states, is based in a new running that is pro-planning, pro-artificial, anti-collapse, pro-universalist, anti-totality, pro-materialist, etc. Uh, etc. Well, and pro egalitarian distribution. It is one that depends that defends that automation is a general principle by which ecosystems work, and that necessary fundamental shifts in geotechnology are likely to precede necessary fundamental shifts in geopolitics. But it is also one that still leaves out many other significances, forms of organization, reasons, feelings, ethics, meanings, systems, values that are already operating in the planet today. These sets of, or these other orders, sometimes are far from the dominant spheres of knowledge, but there is a lot that we can learn from them, and it's important to include them in the conversation. To think about complete, transform, at complexity, or test the scenario that Bratton is proposing respond to, responds to the conviction that this terraforming is still in the process to be designed. But maybe more the suspicion that this is not about a unique way terraforming, perhaps. We shouldn't take the book as the solution, but as the opening of a process of design and conversation to design a technodiverse entanglement of a plurality of mechanisms to be activated. 
So it is wonderful to meet here, two years after that you finished the program. And this initial kind of training to see how the project has evolved, how your ideas of how to envision and design the terraforming are evolving, and articulating, detaching, or perhaps getting closer to Benjamin's framework. A clear statement that we all fellows share is that the approach in the program is about raising questions instead of giving answers or providing solutions. The design consists in the design of the question and the reformulation of concepts that are used to deal with an understanding of what is going on, the reframing of the narration that we have been told. So the program is about looking at the reality from different perspectives to be able to reconceptualize our ideas given for granted of what the planet is. As Cassandra proposes, the future has always been here. It is a matter to recognize the signals on time to be able to act over it. So I would say this is all, and we can start with the videos. Planetarity, a condition rendered through the extensive planetary scale computational infrastructures generating interdependent effects between different scales, locations and times. It provides the epistemological framework that exposes the continuous and consequential flows of the planet. As you look into the planetary conditions of Earth and its ongoing climate crisis, we see that current actions for dealing with climate change by the Paris Agreement, proposed and enforced mainly on a voluntary basis, are not enough. Unbalanced carbon cycles and uncontrolled resource extraction reveal the absence of a plan to govern both planetarity and planetary conditions. What would a governance system for climate change look like if it took Earth as a part of space instead of space as an expansion of Earth? What if our experience and comprehension of Earth as a world expanded into a different status closer to that of the Moon, Mars and beyond? A place where we necessarily have to artificially plan its resources and operate them via new and deliberate legal and epistemological apparatus. In Russian, the word for space is cosmos. In its Greek origin, the concept of cosmos describes the physical nature of space and Earth together. Contrary to astronauts, which are those who traveled from airspace to outer space, cosmonauts are the ones who sailed through the world, planets, and the stars as a whole. Cosmos Law proposes Earth as a subset of space. It is a holistic legal framework and governance model that can replace an outdated space law and update terrestrial governance. Humans have always been in movement. It is a natural logic that coincides with nature's flows and tides. But our history is also full of the limitation of national boundaries. Today's Westphalian model of sovereignty implies that each state has exclusive power over its territory, including resources. However, planetary flows obey different spatial logic. Geochemistry operates through a decentralized flow that organizes and is organized by interdependent multiscalar and polytemporal effect. As Western history centered human boundaries as the mechanism through which to govern planetary resources, a fragmented and mismatched model of sovereignty took place. One that configured imperialist expansions, disputed markets and short-term thinking, and in the process shaped the initial legal blueprint that would justify itself. Terra Nullis was one of the first legal principles that set the tone for the following generation of laws. A Latin expression for nobody's land, Terra Nullis posits that if a land seems unoccupied, then it's free for acquisition through occupation. It is at the core of the Roman Empire expansion and that which gave the contingent history of colonialism its foundation. Lands external of imperial sovereign territories were seen as empty outsides. The following timeline with four examples will show how the Terra Nullis mindset informed other practices, conventions and treaties. Between the 16th and 18th centuries, naval privateers such as the West India Companies were private corporations granted jurisdictional powers by the North Sea empires. 
they acted as an extension of the sovereign state in colonies as a way to resolve issues of control and enforcement, such as execute convicts and negotiate treaties. They extended foreign jurisdiction into occupied land. The Guano Island Act from 1856 allowed any American citizen to possess resources and proclaim United States jurisdiction in any unclaimed island with the bird guano feces, a valuable fertilizer and gunpowder production material. Under the Guano Island Act, more than a thousand islands were occupied by the United States and the act paved the way for resources being claimed without territorial ownership. It is currently still in force. Both practices are the precedent for public and private cooperation, as well as private forms of jurisdiction execution beyond national borders. In 1961, the Antarctic Treaty System legislated that the continent should be divided among several nations, but the Mary Bird Land portion would remain unclaimed, making it the single largest unclaimed territory on Earth. This agreement will expire in 2048, and new claims over disputed areas might lead to a new global conflict. Common territories have had their status change before, when powerful actors are interested in their resources. Such is the case of continental shelves, underwater parts of the continents that surround coastal lines of nation-states. These areas are full of assets such as fossil fuels and were previously stated as commons. Their status changed in 1964 with the Continental Shelf Convention, which granted rights to countries to claim ownership and explore the areas for their own benefit. As different precedents shaped laws of land occupation from international treaties to disputed political imaginaries, and as technical and social apparatus allows humankind to go further into and exploit unknown territories, one key factor becomes apparent. Legal frameworks are created by need, by those who have the power to either shape them by convention and norm, or by proposition and negotiation. Not only space is seen as empty, but the space of law is also a terra nullis, an empty space that gets occupied and wielded on the go. Land, resources and infrastructure are tied together in an intricate relationship when it comes to territorial exploration and occupation. It fragments planetarity and presumes mismatched divisions for planetary conditions. This relationship gets more complicated as we expand through outer space repeating similar logic. When on October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union sent Sputnik 1 into orbit, a new horizon came into focus. It was the beginning of the space race. Its launch triggered a new set of conventions and treaties regarding sovereign airspace and outer space territory. A new horizon of exploration and occupation called for new legislation. The next timeline looks into space law and three space treaties in more detail. The Outer Space Treaty from 1967 and its three follow-ups laid a foundation for international space law. Because of its Cold War baggage, the Outer Space Treaty focused mainly on safety and territory sovereignty concerns, contemplating international peace. Its main points state outer space as commons, establishing that space is free for exploration and utilization by all nations. It forbids territorial claims in outer space yet it was full of gray areas. One of them is the Karman Line, the border that divides where national airspace ends and outer space begins. Its actual position is still undefined, making it possible for nations to manipulate the airspace area for their own purposes. The Outer Space Treaty also failed to provide a feasible framework for future space issues such as lunar and asteroid mining, debris management, and commercialization of space. One follow-up is of special interest. The Moon Treaty from 1979 envisioned an updated framework, more egalitarian and accountable, focusing on the use of the Moon and other celestial bodies. It emphasized the concept of the common heritage of humankind to outer space activities and proposed the creation of a regime that would regulate mining and prevent the Moon and space resources from becoming a source of international conflict. 
However, it is still currently only ratified by 11 countries, since powerful actors like the United States and Russia didn't support its terms. In an attempt to get leverage to an unbalanced space race and orbital space occupation, equatorial countries put forward in 1976 the Bogota Declaration, which proposed that the geostationary orbit of Earth would be tied to its corresponding location's country as a gravitational sovereign expansion. The geostationary orbit hosts most of the communication satellites since its fixed position allows for antennas to be permanently pointed at their specified location. Again, powerful nation states disregarded the proposition as it is in their interest to maintain orbit occupation unregulated or ambiguous. Since these treaties were first written, space technologies have developed. The perspective on space exploration also changed from being a display of national power to an extremely profitable activity in the near future. The space industry is foreseen to reach 1 trillion US dollars by 2040. Another two contemporary legal blueprints are worth mentioning. With the 2015 Space Act, the United States allowed its citizens and industries to engage in the commercial exploration and exploitation of space resources, paving the way for space privatization. An act that is very close to the Guano Island Act and Naval Privateers' practices. And in May 2020, NASA published the Artemis Accord, a United States alternative to the Moon Treaty that sets the guidelines for the exploration and occupation of the Moon where prosperity is as important as safety and peace. By legalizing private space enterprises, nation states will be able to hire private firms to provide a wider range of space services, including space mining. The June 2020 launch of NASA astronauts to orbit by SpaceX marked one of the most important shifts in the direction of states withdrawing from space and giving room to markets. Today's space law says it protects the common interest of the international community with due regard to the corresponding interest of individual states. So far, it was successful primarily because it has corresponded to the interest of major powers, making space affairs indispensable from terrestrial geopolitics. As the economic interests of individual states in space are rising, a new robust international legal framework is needed to ensure a balanced space exploration that will actually benefit all humankind. Furthermore, the way we govern new resources and commons in space could define how we should govern the terrestrial ones. Space law could become a model to revisit the legal blueprints of resource exploration on Earth itself. After exploring the history of land and outer space legislation, a few problematics come into focus. First is the question of Westphalian sovereignty when state power and autonomy is contained within its territory. In space, sovereignty is defined by the vehicle and infrastructure, meaning that nation-states retain jurisdiction over cosmonauts or any spacecraft launched under their registry, expanding their territory to space via spacecraft. Countries like Luxembourg already hold more space in space than on Earth. On the other side of sovereignty and liability is orbit occupation and space debris. Because nation-states remain their liability for any object they launch, no one else can seize it. With no legal obligation to remove the objects, nations continue to occupy orbits without any consequence, generating orbit jams and immense amount of debris. Infrastructure sovereignty is already redefining the Westphalian model into a radically vertical one, and future orbit occupation depends on better regulation of this verticality. Besides horizontal world order, space occupation is challenging other boundaries too. Current planetary infrastructure is already dependent on an increasing number of space-based services and vice versa. Space infrastructure depends on ground infrastructure. The terrestrial network of ground stations and internet network enables space exploration, reinforcing the fact that, in order to go to space, we need the whole planet to cooperate. However, there are specific places on Earth that are particularly well suitable for outer space activities. Their locations enable receiving signals that could not be caught everywhere. Such territories gain a different kind of leverage over space programs and industries. Finally, there is the issue of competing planetarities. Earth's own planetarity came to view in different ways, varying from astronomy to Cold War military surveillance. 
yet the weather satellite monitoring and modeling developed through the climate sciences have also generated the image of the Earth as a planet. This epistemological framework should be radically used not only for climate monitoring, but also for planetary governance. Resource extraction, infrastructure sovereignty, debris removal and liability, and the absence of leverage against powerful actors exposes how the present configuration of outer space exploration still follows an empty outside logic. Current international space law continues to reproduce law as terra nullis, instead of envisioning a legal status for planetarity as such. Cosmos, the physical nature of Earth and space together. Cosmos law expands space law to include governance of planetary conditions, seeing the Earth and outer space in their indispensable connectivity. It opposes the terra nullis mindset and instead of seeing space as empty, sees it as full. The main principles of Cosmos Law are based on protecting a viable planetarity of celestial bodies through establishing and protecting commons that ensure their planetarity. Cosmos Law operates through a model which embraces spatial and physical properties that shouldn't be separated from the legal apparatus. It is composed of five layers. The boundaries of those layers are defined by the physical conditions such as gravity, size and mass of a celestial body. For Cosmos Law, legislation should not just be written, but modeled. The layers have different spatiality, but also are largely interdependent. Next, each of the layers is explored in more detail. In outer space, Cosmos Law governs interplanetarity spatiality through a mediation layer. Specifically, it organizes logistical issues such as travel in between celestial bodies and asteroid capture and relocation. On the celestial bodies, Cosmos Law governs the orbits of the planets, the orbital layer, their planetary conditions, the ecosystem layer, the apparatus that informs those conditions, the information layer, and the surfaces and depths, the territorial layer of the celestial bodies. The layers are consequent, overlapping, and interdependent. The orbital layer governs material flows and activities located in the orbits of a celestial body. The layer sets a framework for more egalitarian use of orbit space based on the provisions defined by the information layer and geopolitical realities of the territorial layer. The ecosystem layer defines a legal framework for managing environmental flows and activities tied to the scale of effect on the ecosystem of a celestial body. Its operations are largely informed by the orbital and information layers providing satellite sensing. The information layer sets the rules for information flows of planetary sensing, data collection, storage, and communications. The layer operates within radio frequency spectrum and includes infrastructural facilities with adjacent areas that are needed to support planetary scale information networks. Due to ground to satellite interdependence, the layer is interlinked with the realities of the territorial layer which finally governs territorial divisions, flows, and extraction of resources on and below the surface of a celestial body, whether solid or liquid. It depends on the ecosystem layer's carrying capacity. Instead of a world, Earth as planet. As Cosmos Law proposes a model for the governance of many different celestial bodies, leveling their status, it also reframes the governance of Earth under the Cosmos Law proposition, we now explore in more detail how each layer could affect the management and governance of Earth's viable planetarity, corresponding to the urgent terraforming we need in order to reverse current climate change conditions. The orbital layer would be primarily concerned with governing orbits as commons, which implies an egalitarian distribution of orbit space and ensuring that everyone benefits from space exploration. To prevent uneven occupation of orbits that further reinforces the dominance of the most powerful space actors, Cosmos Law would introduce orbit rights, an analog to air rights on the surface. It would ensure that every state has an equal area. Nations would even be able to rent an orbit as an alternative way to benefit from the commons. 
the space industry is already on the rise. Space tourism, cloud services, satellite internet and transportation above the Kármán line urgently require an agreement on commons-generated revenue. Under Cosmos law, this could possibly be explored through a taxation system used towards maintaining the whole orbit infrastructure, similar to toll roads fee, or even operations on other layers, such as climate maintenance. The ecosystem layer would be primarily concerned with the vitality of ecosystems, and on Earth it would establish a legal regime for climate change mitigation. It would identify the hotspots of our ecosystem that are vital to its existence and reframe them as commons. In this regard, carbon sinks are an optimal example, since they are indispensable for Earth's viable planetarity and climate equilibrium. Currently endangered by unilateral governance or predatory practices, algae-rich oceans and forests of the Amazon and Siberia would instead be protected territories outside of any nation-state sovereignty. Besides future carbon emissions, past and current carbon flows are an obstacle for balancing Earth's climate. Constantly informed by climate monitoring from the information layer, these emissions would be managed through transnational practices of carbon capture and storage. By establishing a planetary sensing apparatus on Earth, the information layer will facilitate the resolution of two main pressing issues, one being better monitoring and modeling of climate change, the other egalitarian exploration of space. Because the ground segment is as important as space infrastructures in orbit, scattered areas on the surface of our planet that are particularly well suited for infrastructure that enables exploration of outer space would be identified and protected, similarly to the Astronomy Geographic Advantage Act that protects strategically important areas for astronomy and related scientific endeavors. Moreover, under the Cosmos law, this ground-to-satellite interdependency would be used to reinforce the planetary scope needed for outer space exploration. The need for cooperation could become a leverage for equitable use of orbit and against space monopolies. The focus of the territorial layer would be primarily concerned with the configuration of borders and resource extraction and ownership. Application of Cosmos law to the Earth would explore the implications of sovereignty being expanded to extraterritorial infrastructures. The idea that sovereignty can be fragmented and distributed questions the world order based on the Westphalian model of the nation-state. It opens up a case for more radical forms of sovereignty, one of them being the half-Earth model which suggests that 50% of all of Earth's territory be left to natural reserves, while the other half for occupation of humans. In this case, sovereignty would be reassembled into new forms of territorial hegemony. Territorial resource ownership and extraction regulation will also be revisited. Building upon the idea that resources of the celestial bodies can be only extracted if the ecosystem carrying capacity allows for it, a better carbon cycle management system will be established. Likewise, possession of the resources under the national soil would not necessarily mean that they can be extracted, especially if extraction negatively affects the viable planetarity. Planetarity, a condition rendered through the decentering of the human from the continuous and consequential flows of the planet, Constructing it through the climate monitoring apparatus can reinforce the planet's interdependencies of ecosystems, infrastructures, information and resources, and challenge our conceptions of governance at and for planetary scale. Legal frameworks are created by need, and the law distributes power and gives shape to what is possible or otherwise. Our current and most pressing need is the challenge to reverse the climate crisis, which is also the challenge of matching planetary conditions with planetary governance. Space legislation is then an opportunity. Cosmos law seizes it 
to counteract the status quo of horizontal sovereignty and arbitrary divisions that produce a fragmented planetarity and our separation from outer space. We have always been cosmonauts. The stories that we tell about the future habitability of Earth are continuously informing humanity's chances of survival. And we are not talking about the stories that are told to the larger public, although they are indeed important, but the stories states, banks, and NGOs tell themselves and each other. These fictions guide policies, laws, CO2 emissions, influence the breathability of the air, the quality of our food. These stories are crafted here, in the boardroom. The performance of public commitments, binding signatures and handshakes leads to delusions about actions which always happen elsewhere, in the future. In the climate science fields, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has crafted five narratives to predict how socioeconomic parameters will guide the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. They are called shared socioeconomic pathways and map five different roads forking into different scenarios with divergent consequences unfolding through the upcoming 80 years. There is the green roads, the rocky roads, the highway, and so on. The IPCC pathways refer to historically and culturally specific indicators that do not necessarily prioritize the thriving of ours and other species. For instance, levels of equality, education, or health are measured by their link to the GDP. A mere representation of wealth that is inadequate in addressing the existential threats climate collapse faces us with. SSP scenario modeling relies on the access and availability of socioeconomic data, which is unevenly distributed across nation states and regions. The practice of futurology and climate change discourse often takes the shape of institutionalized wishful thinking. The role of scenario planning is to entertain fantasies of success, constantly deferred into the future, to help explain away present failures. Visualizing the future as a branching tree full of possibilities locates climate change into an outside realm, preventing us from dealing with it. The roads and branches are pictured as metaphorical paths that, it is suggested, we can choose to follow. But the reality is more complex than that. We have already crossed some of the thresholds that will trigger nonlinear and abrupt environmental change, also known as planetary boundaries. What is more interesting than apocalyptic prophecies is perhaps looking at the models that are already terraforming Earth today and think of how they can be made operational. The leakages between present, past, and future 
manifest themselves in what we call governing simulations. They are the models and projections which emerge when separate processes within the material reality are translated into approximate representations of themselves. These models reorganize the material reality in their image, enacting the recursive process in which the simulation governs what it is modeling. We want to look at those models that are already terraforming Earth and take them as the starting point to conceive the future as a recursive and eternal present. We focus on filling the gap between de jour institutional discourse on climate change and de facto recursivity of governing simulations. On the 20th of April of 2020, the price of oil went negative for the first time in history. The oil market runs on futures contracts, which are the forward price of oil, or the expectation that oil will be at a certain price on a given date in the future. In April 2020, the expectation of the value of the commodity going forward was set to be below zero. The practical implication of the negative price meant that oil producers would offer to pay warehouse buyers money to get rid of the excess supply of barrels. At the center of it was Cushing, Oklahoma, the designated storage site for futures, where the barrels of oil tied to the futures contracts are physically delivered. The site is comprised of cylinder reservoirs with floating roofs arranged in orderly grids. This circular typology for the storing of oil was invented by a Russian engineer, Vladimir Shukov, in Azerbaijan in 1878, 30 years after the world's first commercial oil well was drilled there. In the early 21st century, hedge funds and other speculators would use drone and satellite imagery to estimate how full or empty the oil cylinders were at a certain point in time. They would use the images taken from above to capture the shadows on top of their floating roofs, which would then inform the future speculation. And so when the storage was full, the prices would drop. This particular incident reveals how the recursive nature of the process is in fact premised on the different qualities of light. How the drone and satellite sensors that gather data through an exchange of electromagnetic frequencies are here used to register the optical phenomena of light and shadow on top of the oil tanks. They infer the capacity of cylinders which store the products of decay from the organisms that, themselves, came to life because of photosynthesis millions of years ago. The synchronicity of these processes is, however, in contrast with the disparity of scale between the deep time process of fossilization that made possible the extraction of oil and the speed of light trading happening at stock exchanges all over the world. In April, this disparity manifested itself clearly. Crude oil went from resource to waste in a matter of hours and the Cushing storage facility became a dumping ground. A study from 2013 describes how the scanning of the surface of the Black Sea with remote sensing technologies revealed the disproportionate amount of oil spills of shipping origins within the Russian sector of the sea and on its borders. Oil tankers, when traveling empty, carry tanks filled with ballast seawater to achieve the best velocity and stability configuration. The water that becomes mixed with oil particles is then dumped into the sea, either in authorized discharge zones or illegal dumping grounds, to prepare the space later filled with valuable cargo. Sensed through synthetic aperture radar, these oil spills perform as contrast dye used in X-ray exams. They visually highlight where the Russian territory ends in the allegedly borderless terrain of the sea, like the coloring book outlines on its surface all due to questions of jurisdiction, governance, accountability, and value. 
What happens in 10 or 100 or 500 years when the Arctic keeps melting and the sea level rises and these oil borders in the Black Sea spill into other countries? Will Russia accept the accountability and jurisdiction over the task of cleaning up those dumps because they will lead to an expansion of its territory? Or is it that by then, there won't be any nation states at all to care about the territorial disputes? Access to technologies of extended vision and remote sensing inform the way in which fragments of reality are read and simulated. It posits the possibility of control over a territory in case it is identified as a carrier of a valuable resource. This recursive relationship between sensing and sovereignty is, however, not limited by territorial disputes. It can determine claims of jurisdiction over a commodity, an ecological phenomenon, or even a metabolic process. The resolution of the infrastructure for sensing and simulation appears within the process of climate modeling itself. The standard average resolution of the global climate models used by the IPCC for its fifth report consists of 100 times 100 square kilometer cells within the grid that the biosphere is divided into along the longitude and latitude of the globe. The horizontal model grids also extend vertically up through the atmosphere where it is broken up into layers that can be as thin as 11 kilometers and down through the ocean. The simulation is then calculated in 30-minute steps to inform past or future climate projections. In the IPCC context, the spatial cell is a representation of balance. What is the biggest quantity of data you can feed into the model before it overwhelms the computational capacity that would be needed to calculate all possible interactions with that data set? The question then is whether the same precision can be extended into the space between simulation and governance. That is, how do you render the simulation operational so that it can turn into recursive governance? Instead of thinking of high resolution as an abundance of data, we focus on the question of fine tuning and justification. We think of resolution as the level of precision with which the capture of data is fine tuned. To produce the simulations that are able to govern what is being captured in a way that will bring the desirable ends in predictable ways. Cassandra saw a business opportunity in the growing field of now casting data analytics, and the increasingly complex sensing technologies. From Nader's usage of hot air balloons to create aerial photos of Paris, to Arthur Batut's experiments with kites, to the modifications made by Sputnik 1, enabling it to track cloud patterns, Cassandra carried the legacy of remote sensing onwards with acute awareness of the scope of its applications. Their first breakthrough happened with the Carbon High Res Project, Having invested billions of dollars, Cassandra created the physical infrastructure connecting technologies of carbon sensing with the private and public companies who were smart enough to see a new market opportunity in carbon storage. The Carbon High Res project was launched in the spring of 2030 and became a milestone in the ongoing efforts to terraform Earth. The surface of the planet was mapped and captured at high resolution from space, now anyone could tell a red pine from a scarlet oak. The two species most efficient in sequestering CO2 attained the highest value and were hunted for by competing companies and governments. Now in full operation, the carbon high res is comprised of a fleet of satellites which can count the leaves on a fern, perceiving its stems and margins, veins and venules, and estimate the CO2 that each little element can store with a high degree of accuracy. They run calculations in situ and report back to decentralized control rooms on Earth which regulate the price of CO2 in return, transitioning away from carbon tax and towards embracing recursive models that rely on high resolution imagery. Cassandra was behind it all.
Um, hello, everyone. My name is Chiara. Um, together with Laura Cucuzzi, I'm Chiara Di Leone. Um, we're part of the Cassandra team. And we're very, very happy and grateful to be here and to share the project again after two years. Um, in two years, I guess a lot, of, a lot has changed and very little has changed at the same time. Um, I think things that we didn't think would change so much did and vice versa. So it's very interesting to kind of revise it um, at, this, at this point. So maybe it would be uh, good to kind of go a little bit into our motivation for starting this project back then and then kind of see what happened in between. So um, when we were at Stroka, we were presented with this uh, climate scenarios uh, that the IPCC publishes, um, and we found them to be very conservative and very um, reproductive of the present uh, that we have already um, in many ways, some of which we have explained in the video. Um, and so we, we tried to find ways to, to challenge this, this idea of the future, not just in terms of having more imaginative and radical futures, but also in terms of what changing and challenging the idea of what the future is and what the relationship between future projections and action and uh, recursivity and governance is. Um, a couple of things I find interesting is that we speculate about the carbon market uh, and we speculate about having this satellite images that uh, estimate the carbon that's in a forest and that some kind in, somehow is financialized and um, the voluntary carbon market has gotten really, really big in the past two years. It has grown to several billions and the price of carbon has gone up significantly um, and this kind of market-based solutions to climate change are uh, more and more dominant. Uh, although I sort of believe in them less and less. <laughs> so I find it interesting that we had this kind of prophetic, sort of, if I, if I say so myself, um, about what might happen. And I think that the way it, it is happening, it's sort of underwhelming in many ways. So yes. Um, yeah, Laura, would you like to add anything on that? Sure. Um, so I was thinking that yeah, the the project started with the, also this critical reading of scenario planning as one of the main techniques for uh, narrating um, the future and the t institutional uh, strategies to use these different um, um, narrative forms to um, justify policies and to justify uh, their this, these practices and so. Uh, I think for um, for the past two years, something that we've learned is that uh, the more you you research this field, the less you realize you know, and also uh, um, we realize how important it is to map the possible uh, literacies and like the possible interdisciplinary collaborations that can be that can happen in this field for a more um, uh, more realistic somehow, but also more imaginative uh, um, perspective about uh, about the future and the governance of complex systems. And uh, something that, uh, because uh, the first time that we see the film uh, projected in front of an audience, apart from the, because it was uh, because of the. Um, the course was interrupted by by the pandemic, and I was noticing again that, like the, for example, the reason why we, ma we decided to make it visible uh, in the video, like the drones and uh, some of the like um, interfaces for machine vision, was a way also to uh, reflect on the fact that uh, it's important to also map the meta narratives and like the way knowledge around uh, climate science is produced and how knowledge and sci become science and how science become policy and how policy become law. So I think this is also something that has been progressing in the past uh, couple of years and, and recently and we're very interested in trying to find um, channels for different audiences also to access the science in, uh, in different formats. and. Um, and the richness uh, that can come from uh, tra translating and uh, applying models for, uh, for knowledge from one field to the other. And uh, um, yeah, so.
I think more or less something else we want to add. No, I think, um, yeah, it is, since that I'm mostly a writer, I don't normally do films, and now just looking back at articulating these ideas also visually, I think that in that being at Stroka and kind of using that extra dimension of visualizing our ideas, I think that's something that makes, I want to do again. <laughs> now that I saw it again. Yeah. I also, ju yeah, just w was thinking about this, and also in the context of this program and Medio Sentientes, the fact that it's very important to also, yeah, visualize all of these different forms of knowledge, and uh, there cannot be only one uh, one point of access. So, I, so I think this is also very, very um, enriching and productive to. Um, think of research uh, also through the, the presentation of the research and the visuals and how, uh, yeah, using all of these different techniques for, for machine vision and for image processing and uh, uh, how it's possible to track all of, all of these different processes, so yeah. And last thing to that, um, yeah, I think that's really important to to have like a, a wealth of different lenses and you know some of them might be art or cinema or you know design um, because if you look at the way that the future is rendered in a big institutional context it's always through a paragraph or a quadrant that tells you oh xyz is going to happen in 10 years um, there is a graph and it sort of ends there or there is some kind of simulation that's like sort of emotional, like intended to provoke some feelings into the participants of this scenario planning workshop. Um, but it's always the same language and it's always the same articulation of the future. And like, I mean, the suspicion is that maybe we could try something else. <laughs> so yeah, but thanks everyone for watching our project again. Um, sorry about the mismatch of the Spanish subtitles, but will upload a correct version online. So yeah, thanks everyone. Hello, uh, my name is Vlad Afanasyev. I'm a designer and researcher from Ukraine and I did, I'm responsible for the Cosmos Law. Uh, together I've done it in collaboration with Brazilian artist Luisa Crossman and Georgian urban planner Yelena Derjania. And we were kind of interested into, into space law because we were, we were looking into absence of the planetary governance, uh, into absence of the governance of natural flows and what we kind of need to do in the climate change because of our current model of governance of different state Westphalian model of governance. And we were looking into the uh, space law, kind of looking back how, how we came here to this point, and we were looking at the past of colonial legacy, the kind of this concept of terra nullius when, when people were coming to the, to the foreign land, like it was with Australia, they see, haven't seen their civilization, and they treated land as empty, and that's basically how, how it is with the space law now. And so we kind of treated what, what film does conceptually and visually uh, to kind of create this epistemological model where we as humans kind of were migrating from the point and expanding to the point where we expand to space now and we're expanding the logic of the laws that we had from the colonial past. And we try to reverse this logic and create speculation what if we are looking from the space on Earth back and how then we would govern the Earth, not as a kind of our human perspective, but as a perspective of planetary. Because basically now we're confronted with this reality of planetary crises, such as climate change, pandemic, with the time much longer than the kind of our human history. Oh, what else to say? <laughs> I'm not a writer, I'm a designer. <laughs> uh, so it's harder for me to talk. How, yeah, the, we, we ended up in the very strange situation because it's quite a niche topic. It was a niche topic two years ago because there was only like, if you know something about space, you probably know that Elon Musk sent a Tesla uh, out of space. And this is kind of like the state of thing. And 
yeah, the, there is not even institutional like research uh, body about space law because it's very niche, like space lawyer. They're they're not a general lawyer. They lawyer only for space, and like there are some artists that work with space, but they don't don't work with legislation. So we kind of struggle to find an institutional base to develop our project. But on the other hand, the last two years were just insanely, uh, how do you say, like the evolution of space activities was incredible. Like just the last month, the China released white paper, the first white paper in the five years exploring the the kind of perspective on the space and planning together with the space legislation and the same did the United States and Russia. And basically space right now, it's uh, for the last two years, I think became everyday life of everybody, everybody knows this. This is kind of the part of our life. So, yeah. Also a space, um, what's Elon Musk's company name? SpaceX satellite crashed into the moon. I think two weeks ago or something. Yeah. Random fact. But yeah, I think... <laughs> um, I wanted to make a connection between Cassandra and Cosmos Law because I think that both... Um, like a central team to both projects is trying to break with a reproductive past, like with reproducing the past. So. For example, space law says, well, if territorial law on Earth is not good, then we shouldn't expand it into space. And in the same way, we try to say, well, if the models of thinking and acting upon the future are based on Cold War dynamics and they are not sufficient, we should try and find new models to do that. Um, and yeah, I think also in terms of the awareness that uh, the general audience has in terms of uh, how important scenario planning is. There has been a lot of a lot of progress in the past two years. The IPCC came out with um, uh, with their sixth assessment report, and they narrowed down their scenarios quite a lot. Um, and that's a really good thing because um, basically before uh, there was the very utopian scenario where uh, you know you could you know the the, the carbon emission just do this. Um, and you would have, you know, still economic growth and still everybody was very, very rich and very happy. But, you know, we would have photovoltaic panels on ev everywhere um, and like some kind of crazy assumptions and they got rid of these ones. Um, and they also got rid of the very, very, very bad ones. Um, so, and I, I've seen a lot of discussions and a lot of like critical discussions around this. So I think, I think in that sense that um, we we were on the right track, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Also, uh, yeah. I also noticed watching again Cosmos Law, how many um, similar, like similar interests we had when we started the project. And uh, um, for, for example, like the different layers of like sovereignty and the different layers of like uh, the spectrum between resource and waste that can change across time and this is something that really has uh, has animated our work from the beginning and uh, i was thinking in relation to this also to the fact that uh, this can also be applied to information for example that information through time across time can become something uh, really common and uh, and available uh, uh, even there is an abundance of it and then when uh, mm, certain entities um, detect some uh, possibility for value extraction from this information, then it becomes a resource and then it's not free and available anymore. So also in, in terms of this uh, ecology of, uh, of how knowledge and how resources are distributed, I thought there was also this meta layer somehow of like, yeah, related to, yeah. Yeah, also another connection is just the interest in um, kind of operationalizing a framework and not just saying this is how things should work, but so trying to build a model that goes, yeah, that's, that's not just a description. Like you said, that the Cosmos law will not be written, but it will be, a mo it will be modeled. Um, and I think that's a really interesting concept. I think that kind of percolated the entire terraforming group in general. This idea that it's not enough to kind of describe how you want things to work, but you should design some mechanisms through which these ambitions can 
can be operationalized and can, can, can you know, be true. Um, so I guess that was both our ambition. What do you think? Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think that's what we kind of do. I think it's important to get to the audience the idea like that we're not nerds. We're just trying to kind of apply our skills to the topics that are not usually a part of our discipline. And so that disciplines are also benefit from our skills. And so it was like, for instance, modeling doesn't really apply for, for a law. And although it's our team. And like with the, with the Cassandra, it's not like the remote send is all, 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 often applied for scenario planning. So yeah, um, it's very much related to the Media Lab program right now. So maybe, maybe should we open up to questions and stuff? Uh, yes, I don't know if anyone, someone wants, uh, I can like follow up precisely with uh, this last comment you like or this kind of connection you brought uh, between both projects that I was also thinking about to what extent there is a or it, have you have a common conversation because um, in relation to the model and how to, you propose to model the situation instead of write you know, the possibility or, or the or the regulation uh, have you like any point try to imagine how this model or how this um, um, can be generated or can be generalized? I mean, one of the most interesting parts of the program is the interdisciplinarity. And of course, we like, uh, I, ha I faced the same problem, no? or the same situation where we were thinking about possibilities, but then how to imagine or envision this could real, really happen. So we try to ask to the expert in computing, like the computer engineering we had in the program to imagine or envision how this model could be. So I wanted to, or I'm curious about if you have been thinking this previous stage, not how the model could take part in the uh, regulation of the sovereignty of the territories, but the main <laughs> kind of governmental force in the construction of the models, who would be in charge of the design of the model, or what would be the the reasons that could address the design of the models could could be the interest underneath the motivations of well we all know that the, all these kind of layers uh, had a lot of implications in how the model performed so I'm curious about if you have get to start thinking on in those terms of yeah the, the main engineering of the of the models and how they can perform in a way. Yeah, um, I think to bring a couple of example, uh, our team were reached by outer, um, Australian Office of Outer Space that work with uh, uh, with Artemis Accord. So they work with Australian uh, Space Agency and they work on Artemis Accord. It's the next mission to bring people to the moon. And it's like a collaboration between different uh, nation states. And they basically try and to because there is a lot of spatial problems, like you cannot, by the treaty, you cannot say who is territory because territory is for everybody. So they're trying to kind of avoid it and they invite in landscape arch architects, different designer to kind of develop it. And also Microsoft Azure does similar thing. It's uh, their AI based uh, AI cloud that does many, many things with satellite and remote visions, and they basically bring in like the Earth into the metaverse, which many right now corporation does. And just a couple days ago, the Space Force, the United States uh, force that regulates space activities and kind of space terrorism, and all of that, they decided to build their own metaverse where the, the army of the United States would be operate. So the army of the United States will govern outer space activity through the metaverse, through the model that they built. And thus is like this really question, how do you design this model? And it's like, it's, it's a model for military. But nobody's going to space, right? There's 10 people. That's how we do it. We do it through the model. Is that something you wanted to hear? Um, yeah, I was thinking like f uh, since the very beginning actually we thought that uh, something we would want to do would be to work with institutions. 
and in the sense of like participating in their scenario projections and uh, perhaps like also intervening in uh, um, the design, for example, of the of the um, production of these scenarios and uh, like yeah, putting together like a um, interdisciplinary team and. Uh, in this way, like to uh, try to have this kind of interactive uh, um, collaboration with institutions, but I also think that um, the act of like visualizing and presenting in different formats these um, models and these alternative models in itself is um, um, has a huge impact, I think, in the expansion of the imagination around the, in the, in, in the, around the, yeah, the, the limits of this field. So I also think that, yes, it's important to try and collaborate and reach out to institutions, but also to present um, a vision, perhaps, that if it's out there, maybe it will actually attract interest of the institutions. And uh, yeah, so I think both ways it's important. Um, yeah, so in terms of uh, governance models um, and how, yeah, where, where is the agency, that, where does the agency reside, basically that's where you're asking, like how can these models become real, like who gets to decide, right? And um, I think that, you know, everybody thinks that, you know, wouldn't it be nice if governments weren't so important and if we live in like a post-nation state world and we've been speculating about that since a long time, but... Um, and you would think that that would be the case, especially with a pandemic, because, you know, the COVID doesn't care if you're Spanish or from Ukraine, but actually we've, we've seen a further, like, sort of balkanization or, like, further enforcing of borders. Um, and I think that, yeah, governments and nation states are still hugely important. And, um, and that, unfortunately, or I don't know, they are the key to coordinating um, and kind of reach planetary scale governance. I think governments are still keys. You know, um, if you think about the IPCC um, scenarios, they are the blueprints from which governments make policies and they are the ones that translate this like planetary scale goals of reaching a certain um, level of emissions or a certain um, temperature um, they translate these big goals into smaller ones and then they kind of, um, um, yeah, communicate them downstream. So this is the, the way that things work now. And of course, I mean, a lot of people really believe in the market and in other ways to do things that are outside of, of the government or at least in, you know, in their imagination, they are outside of the government. So. Um, there are different things, but you know. Also, in our video, we speculate about these oil spills, and um, we speculate: Oh, in hundred years, what will Russia do when the oil, uh, you know, will they clean up? They will. Will they want to have territorial claims? But well, probably, because I mean, I don't know. I think it, this is this kind of fiction of nation states is something that's sticking uh, way more than than we would have hoped. So, yeah. 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 No. And anything. Oh, sorry. You were going to add anything. I just wanted to add that, like, yes, there is the la layer of the nation states, but but there's also other layers that are much harder to track, and they are those that uh, include the entanglements with, like, corporate entities and, like, other forms of uh, uh, com commercial entities, and, for example, those that uh, lead the exploration of uh, not only, like, uh, the moon and, and uh, celestial bodies, but also of uh, the seabed, for example. And um, because of the interest in turning the seabed into a resource, then also there is a possibility to map the other areas of the planet or the outer of outer space, and this information then can lead to other kinds of uh, representation, not only the extractive one. So yeah. No, yeah, that is uh, super interesting, and also I have to say that um, while watching again the videos and really, like uh, paying attention to these connections, and um, I noticed how that I would say both, but maybe co more Cosmos Law is um, proposing um, uh, this alternative or this m transformation of the governance, focusing on um, the very physical conditions of the um, celestial bodies. No, you. Talk about mass, size, or weight, even no, 
And I was thinking that maybe um, this could be also a way of imagine or envision a kind of distributed governance in a way that maybe this um, um, yeah, governing through models that, that and sensing by models um, could regulate the resource destruction of resources and the, uh, uh, this kind of uh, situations more related to this physical um, condition and uh, material. And then in terms of populations, uh, because uh, yeah, populations of movement of people, maybe the governance has to come in another way. So I was wondering if, have you ever speculated about a distributed mode of governance that could act through different kind of mechanisms and tools in depending on what is the thing or the body to be regulated? Because you were saying no, that right now with the pandemics, these kind of yeah, speculations came to be super like um, provocative or radical importance because of the times and we have experienced that we have certain kind of movement of goods but then other kind of regulations for the movement of people but at the end there is a moment where the bodies uh, are or the pers the people are the ones that are suffering the stronger control over the movement so um, have you or get, did you get to come have a conversation about what if there are different kind of government models or sy systems operating at the same time, depending on whether what is the, the thing to be governed. Yeah, uh, I think what Cosmos Law trying to do it's say there is no, absolutely no governments. There, is, like the space of law is empty on the level after nation state. And we don't have any body of governance that regulate the macro scale, what is bigger than the nation state. It doesn't say it's like we don't need to get rid of the nation states. The nation states are effective on the certain scale. And on certain, they are not. On certain, we need supranational institutions, something bigger. On some issues, we need smaller. Like, for instance, city governance is much better in some issues than than the state governance and like coalition of the cities, for instance, C C40, I think it's called, uh, like coalition of a 40 city. They much better, they, they they much better improved our climate change condition than the uh, than the states are because that's where emission happens in the cities. And so, like there was sociologists who said the states are very bad for the big thing and they're very bad for the small things, but they're very good for the, like, for, for what, for the appropriate scale. And about the decentralization, I don't know, like, the, the supranational institution quite decentralized. Like, PCC, uh, it's a supranational institution, the one, like, the International Panel on Climate Change. There are many peoples, they are there by merit, they are there on their initiative, they are working for free. Like, for instance, Kyoto Protocol that's uh, protecting a zone hall, it's just a protocol, it's a treaty, it's an international treaty, and we don't need to really govern it by, by some, some one person or one committee, we need international law that protects some things from from doing. You could rebrand space law, a cosmos law as space tree or something, tree. like decentralized space law. <laughs> um, yeah. Are there other any other questions? Um, thank you for videos and for expanding my mind a little bit because I really like this uh, this loop how to like reinvent our uh, like current law uh, through the this outer point of view and uh, I noticed interesting fact that uh, we have a borders but borders are flat yeah it's like 2d image mapped on a sphere um, and the law, like written accordingly, accordingly to that, it's like flat law or 2D laws, yeah. And when and this is happening because of gravitation, <laughs> so we can uh, use these flat laws because we have this force that applied, and like we have a barrier, yeah. It's a problem. We can't uh, 
like go or jump through the uh, through this and um, it's interesting question how how this volumetric uh, like borders uh, and how volumetric law will like look like um, and I also like this connection <laughs> to the gravity force yeah so uh, space is not linear in that case and this is interesting in place where like bureaucracy meeting Einstein uh, physics model uh, and this is really interesting to think about law um, in terms of black hole like what is how, how it's like going that because uh, even the time is going different uh, in that place so yeah it's that was cool to think about uh, this thank you <laughs> Thank you. I, I really like this framing, uh, Low Meet Einstein. <laughs> but it is about like the, the concept plan energy that's important for, for both of our project and the kind of for the terraforming program in general is the kind of, uh, like for instance, Deepish Chakrabarti, historian, he distinguished global history, like the history, how we imagine like the globe through the like capitalist expansion, through the Facebook uh, information infrastructure that's kind of like the human layer and our technologies from the planetary history, which much longer than we are. And the kind of, I think the current challenge that we have, how we transition from the old globe mode to this new planetary mode and pandemic is a good example for it. It's like now we kind of understand that that the planetary force is much stronger than our human forces, and there is nothing you can do with it. Yeah, I also thought it's uh, it's very interesting to to think this way and to think of how sometimes is the perception that changes also the the concept somehow in your head and also how it's uh, it's shared and i was thinking for example that yes um, so many of the structures and infrastructures and legal infrastructures about the like around the earth uh, don't work or are not efficient for example because exactly they perhaps they apply bidimensional parameters to something that is not and i was also thinking in terms of the volumetric cinema and like how when you're using a um, virtual environment for example that of like you use in game design and like if you can apply a property to an object or a texture and then make it behave in a certain way and thinking of like how yes you cannot um, apply a certain law uh, or a certain uh, restriction to that object because it just doesn't respond and so I was thinking how it's it's uh, it's generative in this way to think through the representation um, as opposed to the the theory or like just um, um, acknowledging the history uh, and not thinking about like a more speculative, more imaginative uh, form of representation. And yeah, I think what Cassandra trying to do that to say that scenarios that seems like just a graph or just a story that we came up, it's actually built by the model, but the very complicated model calculated by supercomputer that's built on the real model of the earth that we kind of don't see that's we it's in the back end, but it's actually a real model of the real earth. Hi, um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it's really interesting to see the, the projects and I am interested in this part of, um, of the spatial debris that you refer in the Cosmos Law, uh, specifically in this part of the satellite, let's say pollution, there's this amount of like a calculation of uh, Luxembourg is has more space uh, amount rather than space in, than in Earth. I was wondering first, like, how is this calculated? How, how do you come up with, with this uh, sort of, um, yeah, yeah, comparisons or, or relations? It's a joke. <laughs> we luck. decided not to say, but that's a quote from the president of Luxembourg. That's great, yeah. That's because they signed, a, like, a couple of years ago, they signed an agreement, and it, that kind of was a joke. But, like, the, if you think about the 
comparably how much Luxembourg uh, have space in relationship to other countries, to like huge countries like Brazil or something, uh, and how much they have satellites in comparison to other countries, they are actually much bigger than 80% of the countries. And that's what our project trying to show. That's the, we might think that space for everybody, but in fact what defines sovereignty of the space is not like the, the rocks, and we don't need to give the passport to the rocks or the sovereignty to the rocks. It's infrastructure that we send there because that's what's important on Earth. Because, for instance, if, uh, I don't know, Spain decided that they want their own internet, their own firewall, like Russia decide, they cannot do it without the satellite. And thus, who, who has more satellite, this really controls the Earth-scale, planetary-scale infrastructure. And this is only three countries who does this. It's Russia, China, and the United States. Okay, uh, just to follow up on, on this topic then, um, I mean, the, the satellite, let's say, um, kind of like formation or how this, uh, like, I don't know, like a pollution of, of this uh, overloaded space uh, presence. And um, I don't know, how, how, this, you, how can you arrange this or how can you go deeper into that topic, I don't know, in this kind of research, let's say, of how should be this arranged? You know, if there's the, already clearly uh, uh, private interests dominating this this place now. You, there's these few companies which are overtaking the spatial area, the sphere. So is there some proposal already or some ideas of how to go further into that? To regulate the space debris? Yes. Yeah, there are and everybody very, very scared about that right now. And firstly, it's come from scientists because scientists are very, uh, very cautious of the, pol the light pollution provided by the Starlink, new, uh, new satellites for the internet by Elon Musk. Because he basically, the last year, put more satellites th than they were for the last 50 years. And if it's going to continue this way for three years, we're not going to be able to use any uh, terrestrial-based telescope, which, like, very important for scientific discoveries. And like, well, yeah, we have, we have now the Space Web Telescope, we have now, now Hubble to telescope. Other is not gonna work if there would be enough debris and there would be enough satellites. So the first who want to regulate this thing is a scientific committee that's trying now to push to stop the Elon Musk, to stop the Amazon Kuiper, which is the same project, stop other commentary, uh, companies for, to send in it. And another problem that's like the past year, ESA, was going to crash into the SpaceX satellite. And like, if satellites crash to the moon, it's not really a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not nice, but if satellites crash to an another satellite, it's, it's very much a problem because it generates a huge amount of debris that will crash other satellites, and it's like a chain effect. And the basically, SpaceX just pissed a couple of <laughs> uh, emails from ESA and reply them in three days, oh, sorry. And the ESA needed to uh, make a space up, like special operation to create an alternative trajectory to avoid the SpaceX satellite. So it's a private company by Tesla, which is re recently like 30% of all Tesla went back to factory because they were shitly made. So it's need to be regulated and it's need to be regulated very fast. And it's very important, yeah. Yeah, I also think that um, if Elon Musk actually manages to implement this, its plan of sending all the satellites into um, into orbit, I think there will be virtually no rare earth materials left on earth. So it's a really like very material, very serious thing. And um, I feel like um, maybe that's something that I always being critical about also Estrelka that uh, there is the idea that you always need to have some kind of incentive not to let people do bad things. You can just forbid them to do bad things and punish them when they do and regulate and make them pay taxes and prevent them from, from doing that. Um, and I mean, the US would have totally have the kind of power to stop, you know, 
uh, SpaceX from doing these things. The US alone, you know, even without thinking of a planetary uh, coalition of China, Russia, and the US, it's literally the US could do it. Um, but somehow we, we are here thinking like, oh, how can we find a way so that everybody's happy? And like, no, I mean, you can just, don't, don't let the guy do this. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was also, I, I came across a piece of news that I'm not 100% sure it's verified, but like it was actually about a Chinese uh, private company uh, launching um, a satellite to collect the space debris, and they already collected some. And this is also something that has been just done and not decided at any level. And of course, like there were comments of like um, American journalists commenting that, you know, this is a some sort of like breach of sovereignty of, of, of space to do something actually good for space. So it's, it's very complicated. I don't even know like exactly how it went, but like these are also issues that will emerge for sure. Like these initiatives also for virtuous um, uh, purposes and uh, that create all of these uh, like problems and the resistances, so yeah. Yeah, uh, I think in this case, when uh, Chinese uh, satellite collected uh, these debris, uh, a lot of people from the space uh, fields, uh, they saw um, kind of security issues, because uh, if this satellite can uh, collect uh, debris, it, uh, it mm -hmm. also can collect uh, other satellites. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a huge problem and should be regulated as well, yeah. It wasn't really the case because there is a liability convention and arm convention. It's a treaties from the Cold War which basically forbid you touch other country satellite because it would be considered an act of war. And that's why it's because we have outdated treaties, you cannot do something new. And the treaty is going to change because they're 40 years old and there was no Elon Musk. The only states could, could launch a rocket. And what people were afraid about that somebody would launch in the space a nuclear bomb. Yeah, I, I want to ask when you say like don't let the guy do it, that it's amazing. Actually it's like yeah, this is how things should be, but then there is a thing that these guys are incredibly rich. And if the way to punish them is about taxation, maybe it's not enough because they could pay whatever we can imagine. So wondering, well, this is a continuous thinking about what could be other ways of punishment that is not like uh, killing them or <laughs> or ask for a lot of money. Like, what what are there, yeah, what are the reasons or how to imagine like other um, ways of um, yeah, kind of cooperation or solidarity that is not in relation to. Um, yeah, to the to the money because at the end this is this seems to be not enough. I don't understand. Oh, <laughs> no, like what can like what are the ways or what other ways can we imagine to um, make the guys do good things instead of bad? Like maybe it's about education or sharing or communication or like how to make the guys, the bad guys cooperate and work in a good way instead of a bad way, not instead only by making them pay. Putting them in jail, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like maybe if we think like, if it is so clear that this is not a good thing to do and we all can kind of agree, if it is so evident, maybe it's because it is not that evident, or maybe because these nations or, or the governors are also like inside of this kind of bad uh, behavior. So I mean, what are like, where is the good and where is the bad? Because maybe yeah. for us it's super evident, but not for them because they are pursuing other kind of interest or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, you know, Elon Musk or whatever, it's just a kind of a caricature of an infrastructure and the system that made that kind of bizarre characters possible and that portray them as being success, successful, that build the kind of social and economic underpinning structures that allow them to do that. So I, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, obviously, <laughs> change everything, but yes, sure. I don't, 
I don't know, but for now, I mean, there are very obvious things that, to me, I think nation states could do to stop them, and then, yeah, like totally reforming a capitalistic system, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> maybe, but yeah, I mean, it's like, really, you know, like a very big, big question, I have no idea. <laughs> I didn't pretend you to raise the question like this, sorry. It's like about like a reflection, like maybe it's not about the management of resources of, uh, and money, but a matter of education. And this is a thing in relation to how the terraforming is uh, conceived in, in the main program and the main like statement by Strelka, like big uh, or um, geotechnical uh, activations should come before uh, geopolitical modifications. I'm, I'm not that sure if this is, uh, well, I, I don't have also uh, neither the answer, but I'm not that sure if this is the um, way that we are going to achieve the required uh, transformation of the, the planetary uh, regulations or, or, or models or systems, because at the end we can kind of cover uh, holes, but if the society is still being uh, informed with this kind of um, characters and people behaving this way, and these are the kind of people that we have as model are, okay, I mean, that I'm not that sure if the geotech, like, yeah, geotechnical should come before the geopolitical modifications. Oh, yeah, I think, I think I, I sort of under, understand where, where you're trying to get. Um, uh, yeah, I think one point that we tried to make with Cassandra is that, um, you know, technology or like planetary scale technology or even geoengineering is not simply like the brick and mortar kind of canon that suck CO2 out of the atmosphere thing, but it's also more subtle technologies like language or scenario planning. If you give governments a menu of things that they can do, they're gonna pick something from that menu, and it's also technology. So we try to address that specific kind of corner. Um, that, you know, there were many other projects that kind of deal with other things like carbon capture or more kind of. Um, yeah, hardcore sort of in interventions into the, the, the world. And, but I think that things like, you know, policy and law and uh, scenario planning are not in any way less real than these other things that are not in any way less important. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I also think like um, there is a tendency to reduce the like um, one l final lesson from uh, the terraforming program and uh, mm, like I think actually what we realized throughout the program and afterwards uh, continuing our project was that it you cannot really place the blame or the, the accountability in one place only and there are of course more glaring uh, nodes of these ac accountabilities and tracking of how um, yeah, how all of all of all of this infrastructure is then uh, enacted, but then uh, it's very important to keep the big picture and every different layer, uh, layer and every different node in this in the in the layers uh, under scrutiny, and it's important to to keep mapping and to keep uh, trying to connect the dots and uh, actually yeah like trace the genealogy of how all of these processes happen. So the fact that, yes, of course, um, um, technology um, uh, somehow like um, facilitates the work of, the, of governments, but also what technologies are developed also depend on forms of government support and for certain pur purposes. So perhaps there are a lot of technologies that are not being developed because of this narrow uh, vision, for example. And uh, so, yes, I think it's uh, so many different layers and uh, uh, also the, the less, uh, I don't know, even the, the, the boring aspects of the bureaucracy, of the, the processes of how things uh, uh, are enacted and enforced, this is also something that needs to be uh, we need to keep always an eye on, so, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you for the videos and the conversation and, and the, yeah, all these inspiring ideas. So, 
Um, there's th the question comes from from the second project, so Cosmos Law, and I think it goes then to Cassandra, and it is a question about the idea of alien agency and how alien agency uh, reshapes the idea of modeling and turns it uh, from a, something related to management to something uh, related to conversation and perhaps conflict. So for instance, in, in Cosmos Law, the question would be how would alien intelligence, alien law, alien, yeah, lo, yeah, alien laws would be mapped into, into this idea. And then I think this also goes to the question of, of modeling as, 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 a, as, as, yeah, as related to governance. So in which ways, um, uh, I, I was thinking in which ways does the project of Cassandra assume that the earth or the processes of on, 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 on the earth, the idea that these processes can be modeled somehow uh, invisibilizes the very possibility of the earth responding to the modeling activities. I know there's the recursive loop and there's a possibility of this recursive loop, but I wonder in which ways this recursive loop necessarily leads to an equilibrium point, or rather, as it occurs within financial markets, to the continuous production and reproduction of noise. So within finance markets, there's plenty of modeling activity, but there's, it is about modeling human human uh, actors and therefore they know they are being modeled, human and non-human, so it is about algorithms competing with other algorithms. So there's, there's this loop of modeling together with the awareness of being modeled. So then, then there's the, the space of response, so you behave in a different way. I, I don't know if the Earth would be able to synthesize in different, I don't know, carbon dioxide, some bacteria, but perhaps. And I don't know if this in production of invisibility uh, might be problematic or not. So, um, can you? <laughs> Can you tell a bit more about production of invisibility? What do you mean by invisibility? Yeah, invisibilizing the, the possibility of agency of th that which is being modeled, of that entity. So the, the agency of yeah, responding to the model. So personally, um, I'm always kind of wary of kind of locating agency that's outside of humans somewhere else. Of course, we do not have all of the agency that we map. We can only map, you know, as far as we are concerned, and there is always something that's external. Um, but I'm always wary of characterizing that external thing as something that has its own wants or agency. Um, I never particularly like the Gaia hypothesis, for example. Um, and because I think it just tends to anthropomorphize um, the Earth or the planet, and uh, I mean, I, I could talk about why I don't like it, but this basically bottom line, I don't. And um, in terms of um, Cassandra, I think, uh, you know, scenario planning is a technique that does account for kind of external and non-human non agency in a quite 
productive way. Um, it was developed by Hermann Kahn and Rand in the 50s to kind of face the threat of nuclear war. And the, the nuclear bomb itself was something that was conceptualized as a um, poss poss possible doomsday machine, so as a mechanism that once triggered would be automatic and would be outside of human control and couldn't be stopped. Uh, right, so there is always this desire to kind of, you know, understand that we, we do not really have the agency, there is something else. Uh, and in case of scenario planning, it was always this unthinkable that Herman Kahn uh, um, thought of. And um, yeah, I feel like in contemporary climate scenario planning, because it's what we've been looking at, there are, you know, climate models kind of tend to accommodate for this. Um, and again, like I wouldn't know what to answer in terms of agency of, of, of the earth. Um, yeah. No. Uh, yeah, what do you mean by aliens like extraterrestrial intelligence? It is, of course, playing the speculative game mm. so we are here already in the speculative game so why not but it is about yeah this possibility so the so it, it is this possibility of space so it so just imagine so 15th century people going west and arriving to what they thought were the uh, the east india and then they found something different. So this encounter no, with the unthinkable. No? So speaking of cosmos law, there is, of course, this possibility of yeah, this, this and how so of, of this encounter aliens. So, yeah. So that would be how, how is how this unthinkable can be introduced into into this law space. I first, I first gonna prefer that I think I'm quite on the same page with Kiara. I don't think we should romanticize like non-human, like animal entities, non-animal entities, like rock on the Mars, like this colonial discourse. This is Max, Mars is not em empty. We shouldn't go there and do anything, any scientific, because there are microbes. I don't think that's the case. I think we need to accept that we did some bad thing for the nat natural cycles, but many other things also do. And it's a place of responsibility of humans to fix it, but not to kind of romanticize some kind of agency outside of us. I think it's more of a, like, we, we need more agency inside ourselves, in our effort, more responsibility for, for the kind of the system than rather just say, okay, the animals need rights or animals need money or like, the Earth uh, regulators itself. For the extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, <laughs> the Cosmos Law kind of speaks about where law happened, not how it happened. And we, sp like, the least interesting part for me, the most speculative part in the project is that we imagine this uh, law meets Einstein, that we define where law uh, operates by the gravitational force of the celestial body. So thus, you kind of not expanding the law from Earth everywhere, but you expanding it from the every celestial body. So Moon has its own stock of layers of law, and thus it's kind of it can say there was this mediation layer between celestial bodies that's that's kind of regulate asteroids. But how we would regulate uh, contact with aliens? Well, it's uh, it's a question for uh, scenario planning, I think. If I, you know, <laughs> okay. Last thing I want to say about this because I I take the question very seriously. I think it's a really good question, and I think that taking it a bit less literally might be actually very interesting because if you think about the alien as not just like an AD kind of guy, but at, at some kind of outside point of view that can look at what's already here and l make you see the absurdity of what of many things that we're doing that 
you know, just thinking of, oh, what if there were aliens and we are, we are kind of mining the moon and doing all this stupid stuff, like, and, and you know, in the same way that, for example, I don't know, all this xenofeminism maybe in some ways kind of tries to, to you know, this, this idea of alienation and um, uh, being alienated from your own experience and trying to abstract things, and, and I think in that sense maybe could be an, an interesting framework to think about, yeah, space or the future or, yeah, so. Um, yeah, I was also thinking about the fact that uh, when we think of aliens, like we tend, we tend to project like uh, anthropom anthropomorphize also when uh, we think of non-human or post-human subjectivity and agency, and, and that's the, the, the danger as, as, uh, as we mentioned before. But um, uh, perhaps like, you know, the, the alien form could be some bacteria that is falling from because of the moon ex ex extraction uh, on, in the moon and then it arrives and then it kind of like feeds back into this uh, into this process but also to respond to the, the other question I was also thinking that yes of course like uh, every form of representation is violence some, to an extent also language somehow is violence um, and uh, uh, it's impossible to to have a map as big as the territory because the, the level of detail then would be um, anyway impossible to read because of the, the amount, uh, the sheer amount of information. Uh, and uh, of course, um, like this um, aspect of mapping and uh, um, like uh, machine vision and satellite imagery, this is something that is very um, uh, driven by extractive logics. Uh, but also like uh, um, giving up like the attempt completely because of not wanting to feed this logic, it's also quite dangerous because it allows only these predatory uh, intentions to proliferate at a very high speed. So I think this is a very, it's a big dilemma because yes, you don't want to contribute to um, a process that then is destined to fail, uh, but also it's important to try and find um, a way to um, in interject somehow or like, uh, yeah, find a space in, in the cracks to extract, to not to reproduce this extractive logic. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, just one thing. Uh, I think it's very useful for the kind of even for our laws and for our epistemological model to think of aliens as a role model, not real interaction with animals, but the animals, the aliens. Like for instance, there was a this uh, Russian physicist Kardashev who developed three uh, type of civilization. First type of civilization who would be able to gather all the energy from the, their planet. The second time uh, of civilization who would be gather energy from their solar system and that they would need to build like a sphere around the sun and the third who would be able to gather all the energy from the galaxy. And he developed it to look for aliens. But I think this model is very useful for us to imagine how we would develop as a planetary force right now because we are a planetary force. And so we kind of need to think like an annuals, like how, how would civilization in the other planet, in the other solar system would develop? Because for instance, we kind of knew about climate change through the exploration of Venus. We knew about the green gas effect because first it happened on Venus and that's how like, Carl Sagan developed this framework. So in this case, the space is a role model for our, to understand ourselves better and the kind of think if there is aliens because the probably there are there we need to study more and we need to kind of apply these models back to our our, our own home i uh, just wanted to add about uh, aliens and the law uh, i think the main problem here <laughs> I don't know if it's still actual, but anyway, <laughs> I got the mic. Uh, so uh, I think the main um, 
problem uh, of how we can imagine this kind of law is that uh, law usually is written and uh, it's written in some kind of language and we don't know any alien language until we met them. And uh, I think uh, this uh, case should be like um, solved uh, when we met <laughs> the situation. Yeah, so I think it's a simple answer. Yeah, that's good critique of current state of law. That the aliens wouldn't understand. <laughs> Too much bureaucracy. I was right thinking in the same terms as the, what you were saying before, before his intervention that the, this is the way I was understanding the project, like the, the radical interest that uh, I find in Cosmos Law is not about the uh, possibility of imagining how to deal with aliens, but um, the useful tool it is to try to think in wider terms, I mean, yeah, for other planets or for other um, yeah, outer space, to be able to to open the idea of how to regulate our own house. No? So it's sometimes like looking to the neighbor, to the neighbor uh, enable you to see what is not working inside. So maybe the speculation is there now, and you see, yeah, you have this third uh, chapter speculating and um, yeah, telling a wonderful story about how to uh, go to the planets that could also be criticized as a way of why we are going to decide how these other planets have, you know, whatever. But I understand that you, this is not your purpose. Your purpose was to, well, <laughs> your purpose was, but I like to understand it as a way to, yeah, to look outside, to envision yeah. other ways of possibilities of rethink or redesign what we have already here that it's, well, we all see that it's not uh, well operating now or it's not working well. So, um, yeah, I think this is, and something that is exploitable to many other ideas or, or projects. This is speculation about what we don't know, but I, like why you are not in the center or what you are not thinking about yourself, you can kind of see with a perspective that is then very useful and very rich if you are able to go back and, and apply to yourself. Um, well, this is my last comment and I think we are going to finish and just say super like big, big, big thanks for all what you have shared with us and thank you to all that came and, and be here and listen carefully and yeah to Marta now thank you for everything it was so interesting I think is 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 interesting to having more discussions and not just reading a book or no or no this thing what what is the manifesto or the program you know, what happened uh, signs this no or what is going to what what kind of discussion and perspective we can have in this kind of uh, scale sometimes no and thank you so much everything to come and to Medela to host and co co create the event. Well, thank you. Um, well, I think that's it. So I will do the institutional uh, wrapping up, the boring institutional wrapping up. So first of all, thank you so much for, to the three of you for coming here and sharing with us those two amazing projects. I think they, I mean, we, since the beginning when we talked with, uh, with Marta and Caja Negra, we thought it was super pertinent to bring those projects here because it's, they are dealing with topics that are super relevant with Medios Sintientes, the, the lab we're doing right now. This idea of at the bottom of all the ecological issues we are going through, there is not a problem of ecology, there is not a problem of technology, there is a governance problem, right? Which is what we are trying to address. And that issue of the recursivity, right, that we saw, which is a key point, and how we trigger it in the way we want. Um, I like to think that some, somehow, um, Culture is, is that trigger, right? It's, it's, it's the recursive process. Right, right now here is, the, that, is that recursive process, right? We're thinking about these kind of things. Only that happens in time scales and maybe we don't, we don't feel it like a recursive process, right? So, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Maria, uh, for the moderation. And again, thank you so much, Caja Negra, for bringing this amazing idea to the, to the table of, of Media Lab and co-curate the, the process. And, Finally, thank you to all of you for sharing uh, this space and this conversation with us. Um, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>